Welcome. Welcome to the Founders stage. My name is Otto Hilska. I'm founder and CEO of Swarmia. And for the next 25 minutes, we're going to be talking about engineering the engineering team. Our guest, Julian Lamb, is a, a very impressive first-time founder uh, of Stitch, um, who's recently raised money, become a unicorn, and she's scaled in the CTO role uh, while the company is growing. So glad to have you here. Awesome. I'm excited to be here. Um, maybe to kick things off just a little bit on um, my background and sort of how we ended up starting Stitch. Uh, so my co-founder and I both worked together at Plaid. Um, I was on the engineering team there, and he was on the product team. And we both basically worked on a lot of problems related to fraud and authentication. Uh, when we were building out some of these features, we sort of went to the market to look at, at vendors that we might be able to use to help solve some of these problems. Uh, basically, didn't find anything that we really liked, and we're sort of frustrated that we were having to build um, authentication, which is, is not something that is super differentiated. Basically, every company out there that has a login, which is, is many of them, needs to build authentication. Uh, and so after building all of these things in-house, we were like, it's crazy that, that nobody has built a really developer-friendly uh, product out there uh, that makes it really easy to uh, embed different authentication experiences uh, from passwordless authentication all the way to uh, passwords and, and maybe more traditional forms of authentication, uh, and do so in a really flexible, customizable way that uh, enables great user experiences. Uh, so that was sort of the, the genesis of, of Stitch. Um, and that conversation happened about three years ago, and it's pretty wild to see how far we've come in that time. That's great. Uh, to give people a little bit more context, at what stage are you in terms of people, products, customers at the moment? Yeah, so um, we're uh, a Series B company, um, raised about $125 million to date. Our team is about 70 people. Uh, a little over half of that is still on the engineering, product, and design side of the house. Um, and we've supported thousands of, of developers building on the platform. Uh, we have about a dozen different authentication methods that you can pick and choose from and uh, build the experience that, that works for your use case, your users, et cetera. That's great. Um, we're going to be talking about the journey of a CTO as, as a startup is evolving, as well as building a team, uh, onboarding them, managing them. Uh, but founding CTO is a pretty special role because uh, in the beginning you have nothing and then the role shifts very rapidly as the team grows and the business grows. But really the first job usually is to build the first product that is, gets to some kind of a product market fit. So what did that journey look like for you? Yeah. So. As we were sort of exploring the idea of maybe starting this company, um, I spent some time building what I would call a very rough sort of proof of concept of, of what this product could look like, um, designed some of the API endpoints, and, and spun that up. Uh, pretty quickly, though, uh, as we started to sort of embark on this journey, we ended up raising our seed round. Um, and after that, it became pretty clear that what we were doing here was building a company, not just um, sort of like hacking on a side project anymore. And so my focus shifted pretty quickly uh, to recruiting and building the engineering team and um, really enabling them to go in and build the product. So um, I think there's, there's still some of my code that runs in production, but not, not very much of it anymore. <laughs> Right. Um, what about then? You mentioned your co-founder. You worked together previously. How do you work together? How, how did you kind of start leading the company together? How did you kind of divide the responsibilities? How, do you have any tips for working with a co-founder? Because that's uh, another important aspect of an early stage. Yeah, so my co-founder and I have pretty complementary backgrounds and skill sets. Um, where we do have overlap is product, uh, but my background is, is all in software engineering, and then um, I was a product manager for a little bit before we started Stitch. Uh, my co-founder uh, worked on the go-to-market team at Plaid before joining the product team there. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty clean split in a lot of ways in terms of sort of how we thought about um, dividing up responsibilities. Uh, so 
So he basically uh, oversees all of go-to-market and ops, and then I oversee engineering, product, and design. Uh, but I would say we spend sort of the bulk of our time uh, together talking about product and product strategy. Uh, that's the thing that we really enjoy, just sort of going into the weeds on, um, brainstorming, et cetera. And I think it's been really beneficial to have fairly clear sort of like roles and responsibilities in terms of the teams that we manage and, and sort of what we oversee. Uh, but also as a very sort of product driven company, um, the fact that that's what gets both of us excited, I think is, is a really good sort of unifying um, factor that, that helps us uh, build together. Maybe the main topic here is the engineering, engineering team, building a team. So do you have some kind of philosophy behind your team building, something that you're specifically looking for? How, how do you approach the whole thing? Yeah, so uh, the way that we sort of articulate um, what we look for in, in people we bring on to the team is uh, by two hiring values that we have. And the reason that we think it's important to have um, hiring values as you're interviewing candidates, evaluating their fit, is that we want people to be able to have a lot of freedom when they join to go and, and tackle the problems in front of them, uh, think creatively, and have a lot of ownership over the work that they're doing. And so that requires a, a really high degree of trust in, in the people on your team. And so we are, we're pretty um, rigorous with our interview process, uh, both from the technical side, uh, but also from sort of the uh, motivational side of, you know, what is this, um, what gets this person going, what excites them, what kind of problems uh, do they like to uh, work on. And so our two hiring values are we look for people who are ambitious and empathetic, and we think that's a really fun combination of person to work with. Um, they're excited to think about uh, the big lofty goals that we have here at Stitch and how we can achieve them. Uh, but they're also really good teammates that are going to help make everyone better uh, throughout the process as well. That's a nice way to find a balance uh, in, in the type of personalities. Then. Hiring in the very early days is maybe a bit different than it is later. What's your uh, guidance on the very early hires for your engineering teams? What makes a great hire? Yeah, so in the early days, it was my co-founder and me doing all the interviews. I would do coding interviews and then architecture interviews, and then he would do some of the more sort of soft skills interviews. Um, I think uh, another thing that we leaned into pretty hard in the early days was references, uh, which I think is, is sometimes not super common, especially with engineers, at least in, um, in the Bay Area. And we got really good advice early on that, um, you know, it's hard when you're two people evaluating someone and, and bringing them on and creating a team for the, for the first time, sometimes to visualize, you know, what is this person going to be like as a teammate, et cetera? And so being able to hear from people who have worked with them um, is, is super effective. And so uh, we spent a lot of time on those reference calls of really understanding uh, you know, what kind of a, a teammate are they, where do they spike, what are their specific strengths that uh, we should really get excited about. I think the like number one thing in, in early employees is, is just a really high degree of ownership um, and ability to deal with ambiguity. Uh, you know, you're, you're joining, at, at that point, they were joining two of us um, and kind of an idea, basically, and you have a lot to figure out. You have to spin up um, services for the first time, uh, infrastructure for the first time. There's a lot of uh, sort of really um, wide open space that you can go after. And so people that um, can prioritize the things that really need to get done can move forward and, and accomplish what they need to accomplish when there's kind of limitless possibilities. Is, um, it's, a, it's a pretty tough challenge. And so looking for people that, that have that high degree of ownership and um, are going to be effective at sort of navigating the ambiguity. That's very important. And I feel that that's kind of part of the recipe of the Silicon Valley startups. You have people who are very outcome oriented, who prioritize their own work, think about the customer. Um, and uh, I feel that that's maybe a little bit different in Europe where, where we don't have as strong of a background with great product companies, but it's definitely changing and there's a lot of companies who are here doing that now. But 
How, how do you test for this kind of ownership, outcome orientedness, uh, and how do you build a culture that supports that in practice? Yeah, so there are a few questions that we like to ask uh, in the interview process to help sort of um, understand how people think about the work that they're doing and, and the impact that it has. Uh, in particular, we really look for sort of people who are business impact oriented. Uh, so engineers who are excited to think about you know, what they're building, not just how to build it. Uh, especially as a developer company, a lot of our best product ideas come from our engineering team. And so people who are excited to sort of think creatively about the, the products that they're building. And so we tend to test for this by sort of digging into um, past projects that they've worked on and how they articulate the impact of those projects. Uh, I think you can see pretty clearly people who tie the projects that they're working on back to um, team and company level KPIs or um, metrics or other sort of um, goals that were impacting the business at large versus something that's maybe a little bit more sort of siloed within the team of, um, I don't know, maybe you made uh, some piece of the code base uh, a lot cleaner, for example. It's like that, for the sake of doing that, not necessarily the most impactful. Um, did it maybe accelerate the speed at which developers could contribute code? Then that's, that's super impact oriented. And so little nuances in how people sort of talk about uh, the impact of, of the work that they've done is, is how we sort of evaluate for that uh, throughout the interview process. And then when people join um, and how do we sort of you know, foster that culture, I think a lot of it comes from um, setting really clear sort of company level goals, um, but then giving people a lot of freedom within those goals to define uh, the work that they're doing and, and what they're prioritizing. Um, I think a lot of... Um, there's a lot of excitement too in, in getting to sort of like explore creatively like that. And so uh, we think people's best work gets done when um, they have a lot of sort of freedom to explore and uh, figure out you know, how to make the most impact for the company as a whole. That's great. What about all of this in practice? How do you run your recruiting? Who does it? Uh, how much time do you need to spend on building the team? And uh, do you have ideas about the seniority mix, or like, how, how, how do you, how do you evaluate people in, in practice? Yeah, so it's definitely evolved a lot um, in the past two and a half years or so. Um, I spent a, a very significant portion of my time um, doing everything from sourcing, you know, looking up people on LinkedIn, trying to find uh, good candidates, trying to get them engaged, uh, to actually running the interview process. Um, I like spun up our first um, applicant tracking system. Um, I was definitely sort of like recruiting team zero. Um, we prioritized hiring recruiters pretty early on. Um, and so I think uh, under 10 employees, we added our first technical recruiter. Uh, and I think that was really uh, helpful in terms of sort of giving me a lot of time back to focus on the interviews themselves and closing candidates instead of um, some of that sort of more top of funnel aspect of recruiting, of building the pipeline, et cetera. Um, today, it's mostly hiring managers that run um, the, the recruiting process, and, and they partner really closely with our recruiting team. But our philosophy is, is sort of that the, the teams hire uh, for their team, uh, and recruiting is there to be a partner to help them with that process. But um, the job of hiring really falls on, on the engineering team themselves. And so it's a big uh, part of, of managers' responsibilities is hiring. Um, I, I still run some hiring processes myself. I'm hiring for an engineering manager right now, for example. Um, and I still interview every single engineer that um, we make an offer to, and so I'm still heavily involved. I would say um, I don't think my time spent on recruiting has, has changed drastically, but where I'm spending that time has, has changed quite a bit uh, from yeah, spending many, many hours scraping LinkedIn uh, to now mostly focusing on sort of final round interviews for candidates. That makes sense. Um, the work doesn't end with recruiting, though. So when you have identified a great candidate, made an offer, got them to accept it, you need to get them to be a productive member of your team. So 
Any thoughts on onboarding and kind of how you're thinking about that? Yeah, so uh, our philosophy is, is basically that onboarding starts when you first come in contact with Stitch. Uh, so the onboarding process uh, sort of begins during your interviews. That's how you're meeting some of the team for the first time, getting introduced to um, how we work in some ways. Uh, and so we're pretty intentional throughout the interview process that um, it's as much about selling the candidate and um, giving them the information they need to make a decision about whether they want to join as it is about evaluating um, their skills and their fit for our team. And so we really think of it as sort of that mutual process. Um, there's one thing we do uh, when we give offers to candidates that I think really sort of um, kind of kicks off the more formal onboarding process and uh, integration within the Stitch team. And what we do is we basically surprise candidates with a Zoom bomb, is what we call it. Um, everyone from the interview panel uh, joins that Zoom call and goes around and tells the candidate why they're so excited about them potentially joining the team. Um, and we really love doing that because it, it gives candidates a really clear picture of who they might work with and, and just why those people are so excited about having them on the team. Let's them sort of picture what it might be like to be on that team. Um, and then sort of day one at Stitch, uh, we also have a really structured onboarding process. And we've actually had that since our first engineer joined. Uh, probably felt very comical at the time because my co-founder and I basically ran a series of onboarding sessions. We would talk about things like uh, the competitive landscape or what we think makes great developer products. Uh, we talk a little bit about recruiting and marketing and all these different aspects of the company that you know, barely existed at that point. Um, now the, the function leads run all of those on, onboarding sessions. Uh, my co-founder and I uh, just sort of do a, a company mission and value session. Uh, so that has, has changed drastically in sort of what it looks like. But um, the philosophy there is, is having a really sort of structured first week for people joining the team where they basically learn about every single function at the company from the people who run those functions. Uh, we do some other sessions as well around things like how we work as a team, how we think about using different communication tools, for example. Um, and we also put a lot of sort of thought and structure into uh, sort of what the first tasks are for engineers uh, to give them the ability to ship code. Um, basically, in most cases, day one, um, at the very least, week one, uh, and are really thoughtful about picking um, things for them to work on that give them good exposure to uh, the code base, helps introduce them uh, to what it's going to be like to contribute code at Stitch. And I think the sort of like overarching philosophy from, from all of this is, is just being really intentional um, about how you sort of integrate people to the team uh, so that you can sort of then let them run with whatever it is that they're going to be doing and give them the foundation, the information that they need to be able to succeed. I love that, especially the kind of way to empower the teams really is to give them all the tools so that they can be successful. And, and you need a certain level of knowledge to be able to successfully prioritize your own work. So the sooner you get people on board, uh, the faster they'll get to really own uh, their own stuff. Um, how, do you, how quickly do you know if it, if, if it was a right hire, if, if, if you succeeded in the hiring process? Yeah, I think um, you, you tend to know pretty quickly, maybe within sort of like the first couple weeks. And I think there's um, people that sometimes interview extremely well, and then um, you know, maybe they join. And maybe they're, maybe they're great, but maybe they're not quite as exceptional as you thought they were during the interview process. Um, on the other hand, I think sometimes uh, you're, you're really pleasantly surprised by just how impactful someone can be. Uh, and I think you sort of start to see that early on. Um, part of the responsibility of, of us is to make sure that we are setting people up for success, though. And that starts with being really sort of disciplined in that hiring process and, and making sure that um, we are getting really good signal and so that we hopefully aren't surprised that someone joins and um, maybe they aren't able to have the impact that, they thought, that we thought that they were going to have. Uh, and then the onboarding is also super critical. Um, make sure that 
people are sort of um, set up for success, have the resources that they need, and um, don't sort of uh, yeah leave them leave them there uh, wondering what to be doing uh, on that first day. Makes sense. And do you have any red flags or like? common things that might go wrong with building the team and hiring engineers? Yeah, one thing I touched on a, a little bit earlier is that sort of business impact. Um, and I think something that uh, we tend to look for in, in people is, is sort of grit and ability to tackle really hard problems. Um, but I think there's a really big difference between being able to go out and, and solve and dig into hard problems and being motivated by um, solving hard problems. And so I think the people who are motivated by solving hard problems, uh, maybe a startup isn't, isn't quite the right fit there, because you're going to get to do some of that. But there's also a lot of just like random stuff you have to do as you're building a startup. And so that's why we really look for that business impact orientedness, because if that's what motivates you, then um, you're going to be OK you know, dealing with maybe some of the uh, more annoying tasks that you have to do that might have a really big impact, but you know, might not be the most like, technically challenging problem that you could work on. And so I think that's something that we, we really try and um, sort of evaluate. It's that ability to go after those hard problems, but not necessarily being um, solely motivated by those types of challenges. Makes sense. What about then, in the early days, you're just a small team. You're kind of part of the team, working together with them, building the first products. But one of the big kind of pivot points is when you go from one team to a team, team of teams. So how, how does your role change, and how, how did you handle that? Yeah, so um, started out by yeah, managing all of the engineers. And then um, a little under a year and a half ago or so, uh, we sort of spun up teams for the first time. Uh, and what we did is we had um, one engineering manager join us who um, had previous management experience. One of our early engineers uh, stepped up and started managing one of the teams. And so we basically split out into two teams. Um, at that point, I was no longer managing any of the IC engineers. And I think that was, that was a really big shift for me. Um, I think there's sort of been a, a series of these shifts. The first one is, is going from being sort of yeah, in the weeds with people actually writing code, reviewing PRs, to then sort of my job being more fully around managing people. Um, then it was about managing the managers. And um, in, in about a week, we have a head of engineering joining. And so I won't even be managing managers anymore. And so that's going to be a whole new sort of evolution of the role. Um, and I think it, it's something that you, you really have to, um, I think, be self-aware of um, how your job is changing as a founder, as, as the team is growing. Uh, because the things that um, you know, I was doing two years ago would be just like, so ineffective today. I, I should not be in like, code reviews, <laughs> like leaving comments, right? Um, that would not be productive for anyone. And so I think it can be really hard to um, sort of leave some of that behind as, as the role changes. And so the way that I've tried to sort of deal with that and make sure that I am evolving at the pace that the company needs me to is um, just taking a lot of time to sort of uh, reflect on um, where I'm maybe sort of still trying to get my hands in something that uh, I should be delegating to someone else. Uh, and, and just be sort of cognizant of that. Talk to our managers as well and, and you know, ask them, like, say, hey, is it helpful that I'm, I'm doing this thing? Or um, is that something that you think uh, you should take on or someone on your team should take on? And I think that self-awareness really helps with um, sort of, yeah, letting go of, of a lot of things that you used to do um, yourself. And for the final question, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed by founders who are able to scale with their companies because as a normal employee, you're kind of always learning and so on. But as a founder, if the company is growing 10x, you have to grow with that company or otherwise you're not uh, really able to uh, scale the company anymore at some point. So how do you keep learning? How do you seek for mentorship? How do you, how, how do you learn new stuff that you need to be prepared for next? Yeah, I think something I think about is basically if I'm doing the same job that I was a month ago, then I'm probably doing the wrong job today. And so I think one piece of it is just being aware that um, your job should be changing. 
And then as you start to go and sort of, um, you know, maybe try and figure out like, oh, there's this thing that I need to start delegating, or maybe I need to hire this person in. Um, I, I tend to look to um, sort of experts in, in different areas. So I wouldn't say there's necessarily like one person that I go to, but it kind of depends on, on the problem at hand. Um, we're fortunate to have a, a really fantastic board. Um, and so we'll go to them for a lot of things. Uh, they're, they're really helpful about um, things like thinking about when to sequence various hires, et cetera. Uh, if I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, maybe it's like an engineering management problem, then I'll go to um, engineering managers that, that I know and respect. Um, if it's a design problem, like when we were trying to hire our first designer, never been a designer, I don't know what good looks like in that role. Uh, we talked to just a ton of people um, that we really respected. And so I think it's, it's a lot about just going and, and sort of seeking out experts. And um, you have to identify the problem that you're trying to solve in order to do so. And so I think that's the hardest part. Um, and definitely that sort of like steep learning curve and making sure that you are uh, continuously doing that is, I think, the most effective way to scale. Right. Thank you, Julian. It was very insightful. Great having you. And uh, thank you, everyone who joined. Thank you.